Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't know Ms. Smith was going to say all that, so now I got to kind of collect myself. <clears throat> While I collect myself, I would um, like to recognize staff that are here uh, in the audience. We have some who are listening as well, because I am only as good as they are. And so I truly believe that I stay in here and our department is successful because of the dedicated and committed folks we have uh, on staff. So if our staff could please stand, our lovely assistant directors, Eileen, we have a supervisor, Andrew Macrianis. Eileen's my admin assistant. So I just really stand here speaking on behalf of um, all of the staff. So. Absolutely. All right, so I think I'm good now. <laughs> all right. Uh, Chair, members of the board, Dr. Casey, thank you for the opportunity uh, to present on behalf of the Social Services Board. Uh, I do consider it a great honor to serve as director of such a tremendous group of folk, folks who are committed to making a difference in the lives uh, of the people who we provide services to. And we do that in a way that we maximize every interaction that we have, because we believe that we never know when uh, we come in contact with someone, that we will make a difference. And so we really try to uh, look at each opportunity, each time we engage as a gift, and uh, to make somebody's life better off. Personally, this is my sixth year presenting to you all. I couldn't believe it when I thought about it. Um, as director of the department, in my 20th year serving the citizens of Chesterfield County and uh, the city of Colonial Heights. And I have to say that never more has the why been as crystallized as it is uh, today. The pandemic has truly challenged us, uh, but it's challenged us to be more creative, uh, to be nimbler in our responses to the changing needs of the landscape, whether it's policy changes or the needs of our citizens. It's really challenged us um, as leaders. Our vision has uh, really been challenged to look at what's possible, our capabilities and the impact of the decisions that we make has grown exponentially. It's truly paved the way for the growth and development of our staff who have, we have, been, who have been entrusted to us to grow and to develop into the professionals that they are aiming to become. We've developed new partnerships. We've uh, been innovative and most importantly, we know that we have changed the lives of many citizens who we have come in contact with. And I put this little, I debated whether to say it, and I'm gonna say it. So I say all of that to say, in the words of my two-year-old, I have a two-year-old who I was rehearsing this page with my mom, and he, I thought, was not paying attention. He said, we make a good team. And that is exactly what I'm trying to say. We make a good, in the, in the short, brief words of a two-year-old, we make a great team. Uh, this year, our presentation of our workload, we'll really look at pre-pandemic um, numbers. And we've got two years of data, FY20 and 21, and we're gonna look at what are some things that we think have um, changes that are here to stay, and what are some that we believe are situational and that we're responding to. All right. Um, in line with what I said about our commitment to making a difference in every interaction that we have, um, folks reaching out to us, telephone continues to be the primary way that folks are reaching out to us. While there has been a slow, a small uh, reduction in the number of calls, we're still receiving about 85,000 calls a year, a fiscal year from citizens. Where you will see the greatest change is in the number of people who are walking into the department. And we believe that that is gonna be, we're, we're aiming to make sure that that is a trend that stays. We have, in the midst of the pandemic, implemented new ways of communicating with citizens and allowing them to provide services. We created a DSS docs email address that allows citizens to send us the notification, the, documents we need to process their benefits, you'll see that we receive more emails than we did walk-in traffic. And so we have um, implemented the remote work, which allows our staff to be more accessible to folks. And so we're uh, aiming for those efforts, those initiatives, 
to allow us to continue to reduce the number of folks who have to come into the department. Reviewing FY22 first quarter data, we saw a slight uptick in the number of folks who are coming in. And so what we're doing is we're going to implement a survey in the coming weeks where we just check in to make sure with each person, a quick survey, why they're here, if they tried other methods of resolving their issue and what their experience had been. We believe that that will allow us to get ahead of any hiccups that may be occurring uh, with some of the other things that we've put in place, such as the DSS docs or uh, folks being able to be accessible by phone uh, to, st um, to the citizens. Unlike the calls that come into the general switchboard, where those have slowly declined, calls coming into our crisis assistance team, that's gonna be our team that provides emergency services, whether it is folks who need assistance with rent, rent utilities, prescriptions, things of that nature are the calls that we receive on this particular nine. You'll see that, that um, the numbers have increased uh, for calls about 50% since FY19. The uh, first quarter of FY22 is showing us that that trajectory is continuing with the number of calls uh, that are coming in. The increase can be attributed to um, the economic impact of the pandemic it also um, is attributed to a different way that people are accessing the department. The pandemic really um, kind of closed the doors for a little while, and we believe that people have made that adjustment to call versus coming and showing up. Prior to the pandemic, this team saw about 219 mm -hmm. folks a month uh, who came into the agency, and since uh, April of 2020, they have seen 24 people have come into the department. So we believe that that um, trend is here to stay. And in response to that, our uh, assessment and resource team, I'll refer to them sometime as ART, that team uh, has made necessary adjustments to be able to process crisis situations remotely, uh, to get the documents and to uh, prevent folks from having to come in to access services unless they want to. We have a um, service delivery model that again, I spoke about being nimble. If someone wants that, there are people who want to continue to receive and access services in person. We have staff on site who can do that as well. You'll see that the cases with, um, the crisis cases have decreased, so you would wonder why the numbers, the calls have increased, but the cases have decreased. This is a direct impact of the COVID relief that's been available. Prior to COVID, relief funds. If someone came in and needed assistance with their rent or their utilities, we had to open up a case because they were using county resources and serve them that way. Now we do not have to open a case. We can refer them to the rental assistance programs that are in place to assist people. What we have been able to do where we are not opening as many crisis cases for things of that nature, this team is opening cases of situations that present to them that are a little more chronic than what we had maybe seen before. So individuals who may be experiencing homelessness or things of that nature, where our mindset before was a warm handoff, now we're looking at it more as a warm handhold and holding on to those families for a little bit longer just to make sure that we've got the services in place and that another crisis doesn't come up and put them back into the same situation as quickly. All right, next I'll talk about our TANF program. And I've partnered TANF and our child care subsidy together. Both of these programs uh, provide cash assistance and what the common factor is that they both serve people who are caring for children. So the TANF program, as a reminder, is a cash payment to individuals who meet the eligibility criteria, one of them being that you have to be care caring for a minor child. And the child care subsidy is a cash payment to child care um, vendors. Um, what you will see is primarily the number of recipients have stayed the same. I'll talk a little bit about the exception with daycare and FY20 and a little bit about what was going on at that time. Where we have seen the workload impact with this population is in applications. So regardless of whether someone's determined eligible or not, if they have to submit an application and people have been you know, in crisis, looking for any resource that would help. So they're applying for everything. 
So we're trying to do more education about what the requirements are to kind of uh, get ahead of the application so we don't have to direct resources to that area uh, because the application upfront work is where we're really seeing uh, the impact. I mentioned FY20 for child care uh, recipients. During that time, there was intentional and strategic effort to get kids into child care situations. The, the state provided additional funding and resources for localities to clear the waiting list. In Chesterfield, we removed 156 families from the waiting list. We did not, we no longer have kids on the waiting list. That provided child care subsidy to hundreds of children, and that's what you see reflected in the FY20. So when we think about what happened in 21, the child care subsidy, what that data is showing us is the same thing that we're seeing nationally with child care. There are um, challenges with child care. Some people uh, no longer want to have their children in child care, um, have had multiple quarantines. Daycare providers have had to uh, reduce their census. So all of those factors that we hear about nationally, you see that reflected in our child care subsidy kids as well. Next, I'll talk about our Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Uh, and this program has uh, really played a huge role in um, addressing food insecurity during the pandemic. You'll see that's reflected in the number of recipients who um, are receiving um, services. This program and the um, programs that I just spoke about, all of these programs have waivers in place currently. The waivers allow exceptions to processing, allow us to process them more efficiently, removing some of the um, interviews. Um, Medicaid, I'll talk a little bit about later. We don't have to uh, process renewals. That is not the case for the SNAP program. The SNAP program continues to have renewal and interim requirements. So we are continuing to look at those situations when income changes, um, requiring folks if they don't have a six month review, then we're doing an interim to just check and make sure the situation is still the same and that they're continuing to be eligible for um, services. Currently, the waiver for this program, which is going to be like, like I said about the interviews, is scheduled to expire in November. We will, that will be to be determined. The uh, waivers have been extended multiple times. I just got notice about the child care waiver was supposed to end um, next month, but it's now not ending until December. Medicaid program the same way. And so we've constantly been dealing with changes in policy um, during the pandemic. We do believe um, that this change um, in recipients, we're gonna see the impact in terms of workload for the, probably the next two fiscal years. It's gonna take a while to gradually get those folks, if they're working, to get them redetermined eligible and um, kind of let the <coughs> natural process take its course. I do wanna highlight two things about the SNAP program. You may have heard a lot about the PEBT and the emergency allotment. The emergency allotment continues. That is where every person who is determined eligible for SNANF, I'm sorry, for SNAP, I said SNANF. So that is a combination between SNAP and TANF. I just created a new uh, acronym. But every eligible person who receives SNAP um, benefits their entire, ho the household, they receive the maximum allowed amount for the household. That continues. We know that on a month-to-month -month basis. The state has to apply every month. We do not process that. We do not have any role in that from a local level. That's handled all administratively through the state. Same thing with the PEBT. There's a lot of confusion about the PEBT, and that's for kids who receive free and reduced lunch. That was handled through Virginia Department of Education and the Virginia Department of Social Services. We help to direct questions and we're given tips to be able to answer questions, but the whole approval process, the monitoring, um, all of that was done at a state level. And that created some confusion for our, our uh, citizens because they're so used to coming to us directly and we did not have uh, a huge role in that. So our medical assistance program, and you guys are used to this program kind of growing ever since Medicaid expansion occurred. 
And right now, um, we're probably at the highest that any of us have ever seen in terms of recipients for our Medicaid program right now. And yes, it is because more people are eligible, but right now, the Medicaid program is falling under a public health emergency, a PHE. And so because of that, we cannot close any Medicaid cases unless there are a couple of reasons if someone um, passes away or if they move or they request that it's closed. But otherwise, you're getting Medicaid regardless and the state's gonna find a fix for that um, where we're out of the public health emergency. And so some of that increase is gonna be because we can't close cases. You know, if people aren't eligible any longer, their circumstances has changed. When they deal with the renewals, we'll probably see a sharp reduction in Medicaid uh, recipients. So the last two programs that I talked about, we have identified that group. Those are our two largest programs, the SNAP program and the medical assistance program. We have um, targeted those two groups to work with our employment services team. I am very excited to announce that we applied to become a SNAP education and training locality and we were approved. What that means is that now individuals who, identify, who receive SNAP and are identified as able-bodied, they have an acronym, it's called an ABOD, able-bodied adult without dependents. Um, ABODs, we now have resources to assist them with getting employment. That is a group of folks who have a work requirement, and that work requirement is scheduled to be on, uh, to be back on January 1st. And so now we have the resources to be able to offer additional efforts. We have identified for our SNAP population 10, over 10,000 people who meet this able-bodied criteria. And for Medicaid, which does not have a work requirement, we're creating our own work requirement. And we're just doing, we can't require someone to participate, but we're reaching out to try to make a difference in that person's life. And so <clears throat> we will be reaching out to those groups. Those are two groups, our two largest programs that we're going to offer employment services um, to as a department. Again, it goes with our mindset of wanting to do a, a, a handoff as well as just making a difference and being transformational, not just processing benefits, but really trying to help people be better off as a result of their interactions with us. Now I'll talk about Child Protective Services, and we've been pretty flat in that area. We do um, and have already seen the impact of schools being open. So in September of 20, we had 13 school referrals. September of 21, we had 68 school referrals. And so we are already seeing that schools are, um, you know, kids are back in school coming to folks' attention and they can be brought to our attention to provide services. During the pandemic, what we had been able to do um, is we created a mandated reporter training that is done virtually. So we continue to uh, provide education to the community about how to identify um, child abuse. We did this training not only for uh, school personnel, but community partners. We wanted to try to get as much information as possible out to the community so that anytime you came into contact with a child who you had concerns about, you knew um, what to do. We also continue to have our regular meetings with school personnel um, just to continue the relationship so that we knew that schools were open up one day, that we still had our relationship and our processes in place. Where we have seen a tremendous increase, just from FY20 to 21, 42% uh, increase in adult protective services um, cases. And what we're seeing is a lot of, it's called self-neglect, but during the pandemic, people were living successfully in their home receiving community-based services. In-home providers weren't able to come into the home because of pandemic things, and people, um, their health began to deteriorate, and then that led to an increase in calls. And so what we have done, uh, we have increased our referral, in response to this and seeing the, the shift in things, we've increased our, our referrals to community resources. Internally, we've streamlined processes to expedite any services that may be needed, such as Medicaid and things of that nature. 
Uh, we maintain a very strong partnership with Mobile Integrated uh, Health with the fire and EMS department. We go out often together to um, work with situations. Uh, we also work very closely with Chesterfield Mental Health. We also, we actually have a senior clinician on staff at social services that helps us with adults who have um, mental illness. We also uh, increase collaboration with other county departments like Citizen Information and Resources there. Um, Team. So we've done a lot more collaborating and referring out to the community. We truly believe that we can't fulfill our mission without being able to collaborate effectively. So in the midst of all of those workloads, we had a tremendous, um, a tremendous year. There were many accomplishments. So where I talked about a ton of applications came in, we were still exceeding performance expectations for timeliness. And I think that speaks to just the heart of our staff, being extremely resilient, responding and adjusting to changing policy, changing ways we need to do our work to just get the job done. Um, we also, we talked about this before, it actually happened, it's created, we've got the staff in place, we created an internal quality assurance team. And since creating that team, we've received recognition from Virginia Department of Social Services. Regard, just looking at our process and how we have um, implemented some best practices, we received recognition from Virginia Department of Service, Social Services on our Title IV E program, as well as our Family First program, which is a program that you all helped to support and given us the staff to be able to staff it. Our um, planning and preparation for the Families First Act was featured in Virginia Department of Social Virginia Department of Social Services newsletter as an example of best practice, and so I won't go through all of them. But we have had a tremendous amount of success in the midst of a lot of changing parts this year. And again, I think it just speaks to our leadership team as well as the heart of our staff, and never forgetting why we do what we do. So we can't do it without some pretty strategic. Our collaboration with community partners. Um, I'm going to highlight just one that we've been working on with our workforce development. We are really um, engaged in how do we help our folks change their situation. And so we have partnered with uh, the Chesterfield Economic Development, uh, Virginia Employment Commission, as well as Virginia Career Works. We now have staff who are stationed at Virginia Career Works. We um, also have really uh, increased our uh, technology use. I'm super proud of us because we're social workers and those of you who have been around long know that social services, our presentations in the past, you may have had like one number in it, <laughs> but we had like a ton of stories and narrative. You'll see today we have a lot of numbers and that's because we have embraced a different way that has allowed us to both address the emotional, uh, the mental health and human service aspect of our job, but also allows us to be more strategic, looking at the data and helping us to make more data-driven uh, decisions. So we're now looking at which posts on Facebook are getting the most attention. We now know that our posts for jobs, where we're advertising jobs, is our um, top light um, post. We now are working with Civic Send where we're able to push out information and it has significantly increased the number of people who we're able to meet, um, connect with. We know we have about a 23% uh, email open rate and so we're targeting, how do we increase that? We know that women are the main folks who are receiving our information and so we're using all of this to figure out how do we get, get to people to let them know what we have. We believe we have something great to share in terms of helping folks to get jobs. We have also, in our partnership with economic development, we've created, I call it a profile, but for folks who are receiving employment services, we've gone through and are trying to identify what skill set do we have? So who do we have that has a CDL? Who do we have that knows how to drive a forklift? So economic development can call us and say, we've got a new business coming in town. We need 40 folks who can drive a forklift and we can go through and see who we have as residents that could potentially um, benefit for those jobs. So we're using that to try to be more strategic um, in our efforts. Um, and housing and uh, homeless instability, 
has been the issue that that and food insecurities are the things that we've seen a significant increase in. We have made uh, changes to our internal processes and how we work uh, with staff, uh, with citizens. We have, um, again, I mentioned about carrying cases longer. We have employees who are certified as their SOAR certified, and SOAR stands for Social Security Income and SSDI, Outreach, Access, and Recovery. And <laughs> yeah, a lot of words. But what that does, we have a staff person who is able to help people get connected with disability a lot sooner. So where um, most of our folks, um, are getting approved faster and we have a higher approval rate than if they go through the normal process. And we saw that as a need, particularly with adult services, where um, we may need to get those services in place so that then they can maybe afford an assisted living, uh, assisted living uh, facility. And so we're upskilling our staff to have the resources that they need. We've added staff to our department who have significant work experience in the private sector working with folks who are homeless. And so they're bringing a whole new skill set to the department and their experiences. And it's definitely making us um, a lot stronger. We're working collaboratively with community policing and the Daily Planet. We don't um, technically have the resources that can go out and do like a street team. But the Daily Planet does, and so we partner with them to go out. Sometimes we're able to meet them out there, and so that's how we've been able to adjust our services based on what we're seeing the citizens of Chesterfield and Colonial Heights are needing from us. So I'm going to end on a, um, I think I'm ending, on a <laughs> very good, <laughs> this is like my um, favorite thing that we, all the work we've done is fantastic, but I am so proud of the work that we're doing with the Bringing Families Home program. Last year I stood before you and I talked about one of our priorities was working more closely with Chesterfield County Public Schools with kids who are receiving McKinney Vento services. And that is how this partnership was created. We work with housing families first, Chesterfield County Public Schools, Communities in School Chesterfield, Social Services, and the Housing Resource Line. And we were supported by funds that Community Enhancement identified to help us get this program off the ground. Of course, I keep going to Dan, <laughs> Dan saying, Dan, I need more money to sustain this program because I'm really excited about um, the work that we have been able to move kids in the school system who were homeless into permanent stable housing. And so um, I actually have an update since this slide. The slide says that we've been able to do seven, house seven folks. We're now at 10 um, families now are in um, stable housing. And we have two who are pending with their lease starting in November. And so I'm just extremely proud of this program. These are folks who have many barriers to overcome. When you are caught up in chronic homelessness, there are many barriers that you have to overcome. And to be able to get folks into um, housing with the vacancy rate the way that it is right now because of the pandemic is pretty extraordinary uh, work. So I'm super proud of that program. And I just had some uh, quotes from our partners just talking about the value of that program. One thing I wanted to highlight is that we've gotten national attention, partly because, um, as Ms. Smith said, social services, our, our social services is the best social services. This program is administered in other localities. We are the only one where social services is such a key integral partner and in at the table providing services. And they have, they being Bringing Families Home program, have said that has made a tremendous amount of difference in getting folks connected to services, um, helping them to get established in their new um, homes. And so I'm pretty proud of us being a trendsetter in that way and being at the table in a, a situation that's usually done just with schools. But really the schools have been tremendous partners with us. And this is another, um, just a quote talking about just the value of the program. So there are three areas that we're gonna focus on and I guarantee you next year when I come before you uh, that we will make significant progress on because we are committed to doing so is continuing to work with workforce uh, development. We are working uh, to create a steering committee where regularly we're meeting 
social services, citizen information resources, economic development. The schools like John Tyler, um, Chesterfield County Public Schools focus on uh, workforce development. And we're going to use the framework from the Committee on the Futures report about financial independence for all residents. So I'm really excited about this new endeavor that we're um, moving towards where we're gonna really put uh, this into practice and create, a chest, again, another Chesterfield model on how we do that. The next is uh, looking at recruitment and retention. So I think this may be the first presentation that I've done where I didn't have like turnovers here and we are we are just like everyone else and experiencing significant turnover. And so our staff are excited about the salary study that's being done and anxiously awaiting that. But in the meantime, we're looking at the things that we can control and are and controlling those. We have uh, created a cohort for career development and really um, creating like a group of staff who are gonna meet regularly to say, how are you doing on your career development plan? Just really creating a culture where we are championing the growth and development of our staff. We're working collaboratively with the Learning and Performance Center. We have an engagement survey that was started when I first became director that we're dusting off and making it a little more uh, efficient for us to, to use. Learning and Performance Center is also working with us in creating some leadership training and onboarding for our um, staff, for our leaders, as well as as an organization, how do we improve psychological safety? How do we help people to feel comfortable with sharing and giving feedback? Because we've realized that that's how we grow. If people don't give us feedback, we're not going to grow. And the next um, that we are, uh, will, I'm committed, this IT project with uh, dynamic, integrating dynamics with the CSA is a top priority for us uh, in FY21. And so uh, with all of the staff behind me listening um, and back at work, I truly do just thank you for your continued support and what you always do to help support our department and the work that we do. Thank you. Ms. Rogers, thank you so very much for the outstanding work you do, the accomplishments, the statistics I saw, 98%, 99%. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever seen those type of numbers in terms of success. So uh, kudos to you and Ms. Smith and the entire team and Mr. Engel for joining with them. And certainly, uh, we, we just thank you so very much for the outstanding job you're doing. Uh, one of the best reports I can remember here in some time. So outstanding job. Uh, board members, any comments? Or questions you want to answer. I just want to again say social services in many areas people look at social services and think that it's um, an organization that just helps people to stay where they're at in a bad place but to get by and in Chesterfield County I'm proud to say that that's not what social services mission is. Social services mission is to take people in a bad place and help them to be in a better place and ultimately to be in a place where they can help others that are in the place they started. Mm -hmm. And I thank you for your leadership in that mission. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I just want to add to that, you know, I thank you for bringing us all this information and data because it's really important to us as we do the work we're doing to be and understand really what, what is the reflection coming from our mm -hmm. citizens and what their needs are. And, and, you know, candidly, these last two years have been a significant challenge. And we sometimes look at the folks that are, you know, we recognize those who may be frontline and obvious frontline, but you folks have been frontline all along the way. And so please, you know, uh, pass along our, this board's thanks to all of your folks too for the work that they're doing because those citizens, um, really don't have other means or other resources but for the work that all of you are doing and the reach out that, and, and the ways in which you've been creative about establishing that open door that doesn't mean they have to physically come but you know I, I that is really exciting to hear that we are you know coming up with ways that folks don't suffer with service delivery um, just because they can't necessarily walk to the door and, and stand in line mm -hmm. so thank you thank you Mr. Daniel. Mr. Chairman, yes. I'd just say, um, you know, to Mr. Engel's point about 
your department's singular focus on transforming lives. You all do that on a daily basis, and I've seen, I know every board member on this, up on this dais has seen that through various cases that we've had come before you, that we've referred to you. And so there's a lot of appreciation there but I, I don't think people really truly understand the impact that it can have. Uh, you know, since you've been in the position you've been in, we actually saw a decline in the county's poverty rate pre-pandemic. Most people don't know that, sort of this ongoing narrative of poverty increasing. But we actually were making some pretty good headway on financial independence here in Chesterfield County. And it's because of this transformational focus and you can tell it infects every layer of the work that you all do. And I couldn't be prouder. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. I, I join, thank you again very much for everything. I particularly like the comments regarding career work, how you have a team there. I think that's very helpful and very successful. It's outstanding. And just applaud you for all the great work you're doing. And let us know how we can continue to help you, assist you, be do even greater things, Thank but you're doing great things. Thank you. Thank you.